We were not thinking we would do that. We were actually looking at job offers in London at the time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but we came to visit the school in American Fork. Um, we stepped inside. We felt the spirit of it, the spirit of the people, of the mission, and decided to change our entire life's trajectory and become educators. And we've since had two more children, so we have four total. One is at BYU, one is in London, excuse me, London, Paris. Um, and then we have two that are there for campus, one in 7th grade, one in 10th grade. Um, we have always given our children an option to attend school wherever they would like. They don't do it just because it's dad's job. Our children matter more than that. And all of our children have chosen to take a class or two somewhere else, but they've always chosen to graduate from school because they love what they do. They love their teachers. They love the environment. So, and I love it. I'm maybe one of the most biased people on the planet, so whatever I say today, take with a grain of salt and ask your neighbors what they really think, right? <laughs> so, okay, well, let's do some other introductions here. Um, this is our, let's just start with government. CEOs and executives of multinational corporations. Many of them are mothers who understand children. Uh, many of them are friends of the world, but they all come together. Some of them are donors, not all of them. Uh, major donors, I should say. They all give what they can. 
but they all come together around uh, the cause of this mission. We've added three new ones. Some of you might recognize. Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That's the kind of participation we need in school. Teacher, you spelled that word wrong. I'll do this from this side over here. That's what I was supposed to do. Jay set me up that way. Um, yeah, so that's the that's the board, and three new ones. Some of you might know how he's the um, editor of Deseret News National, and has children here this year. This is our current chairman of the board of trustees, Dan Burton. He's a uh, He's the CEO of Health Catalyst, a healthcare company. And you know, I want to read something. He was asked one time by Utah Business Magazine this, this company um, really took off and turned into one of the few Utah unicorn companies, market cap over a billion dollars. And he was asked by Utah Business Magazine, who inspires you most and why? So this is going to be published, of course, in a business trade journal. And this was his answer that was printed, he said, Jesus Christ is who inspires me most. To me, he represents the ideal leader in all settings and someone who applied timeless principles like love, humility, servant leadership, respect, loyalty, trustworthiness, the golden rule, and discipline in every situation he faced. We strive to help Catalyst to apply these same timeless principles in guiding our decisions and our actions. And often, when I am faced with a difficult situation, I fall back on his example of holding his teachings and have never regretted following that example and those teachings. So, there's your chairman of the board. Um, he is not someone who um, walks around with his religion on his sleeve. He has employees, thousands of them from all over the world, who loves all of God's children from no matter what their background is, and I feel the same. But that's Dan. Incoming chairman of the board next year, Janine Miner. This is one of those very accomplished and experienced mothers that I told you about. All of her children have graduated from American Heritage. They've been at the school for over 16 years. Her husband, Curtis, was a former chairman of the board and the architect of our American Fort campus. He also builds temples. And uh, she, of her own right, is a remarkable leader. Um, she has a, a, a deep and rich music background, liberal arts background, and is very excited to champion not only the cause of our general mission, but uh, fine arts and music and other subjects that are near her heart. Leland, we are so grateful that you came back from China. Leland is a gift to all of us and he's making a big sacrifice to be here. I know. Uh, he was making a lot of money there. He's not making that much money here. Uh, he went from a, a for-profit school to a non-profit school, from a very large and growing campus that he had quadrupled while he was there for those four years to one that has just barely started. He knows that this will grow just as we all do, though. When I started 18 years ago, American Heritage had 300 students. We now have over 7,000. If that tells you anything about um, the, the movement that this is among parents to find a place that is consistent with the values that they want for their children in the classroom. So Leland, thank you for, for coming. I, I know you see this vision. Caroline, same thing. Um, Caroline is an extraordinarily experienced educator. She has experience at all levels, um, including a kind of principal position over grade levels, including in faith-oriented schools, faith-oriented and secular schools in England. Um, I think her students are absolutely <coughs> her. Do we have any ninth grade students here this morning? Yeah. I thought you might be. What's your name? Lucas. Lucas? I think we met down at the, I think the other campus. Uh, uh huh. Yeah, we were doing a little private graduation ceremony for a student who didn't graduate with his class. We make sure everyone graduates here. That's the true no left behind act. We were doing a graduation ceremony. Lucas, thank you for joining us. You are a pioneer. All of you are. But for those that are willing to do the hard work of building and starting and forging a pathway, 
You're going to learn a lot more than you would sitting in a classroom that's just another one of 5,000 students. Uh, because you're going to create the experience that you want. That's true of all of us. You know, we're not doing this for you. It's we doing this for each other and our families, right? All right. Megan was here at oh dark thirty in the morning. Where's Megan? Oh, right in front of me. I keep doing that. I keep looking for Megan, and she's like right here. That's a metaphor. Megan is right here. <laughs> Megan's been right here from the beginning. I think Megan might have been one of the first ten families to enroll. Uh, and Amanda Seacrest as well, also here. Actually, Amanda was here earlier than Megan this morning. These two work together. <laughs> yeah. Let's give them a big round of applause. Let's take Simon to be the PSO president of a school that doesn't even yet, hasn't even opened its doors yet, right? And then I was looking at this, I was looking at this spread in the welcome guide. Um, is any, has anyone not received the welcome guide yet? Raise your hand. Okay, so you've all seen it, because there's some extras back there that I saw Amanda put out this morning. And I was just looking at this faculty, and I was thinking, this is extraordinary. Um, I, I know the quality and the caliber of teachers that we've had at our American Ford campus, and I'm sitting here looking at this, and I'm thinking, this, this faculty is arguably um, more international, more accomplished, experienced. If we put all the years of experience teaching there, it's in the hundreds. Hey, Hal, good morning. Just introduced you. There's Hal Boyd right there. I remember he's on our board of trustees. Thank you, Hal. My children won't be tardy. Big guy. Okay. We <laughs> <laughs> won't pass a pink slip out, I'm afraid. Thank you for joining us. Um, and, you know, even people who have changed me. Um, Elizabeth Nielsen, the ballroom dance instructor, was the one that taught me to dance at BYU, social dance. I fell in love with it. My wife and I competed as a result of it. She just absolutely changed my life. And here she is going to be teaching your children and your families, and I hope you, she'll do things for adults too, I'm sure, if you learn to dance. Should I put the microphone down and do a little demonstration? <laughs> Maybe at uh, the, the noon break or something, right? Mr. Angie. Um, I mean, I could just go down, we have, and it's not just teachers that have come here to start teaching, it's teachers who have also been teaching with us at the American Ford campus, and some of our superstars. Um, and, uh, you know, Mr. Cornell, and I, I wonder if, is, is, is Lakin here today? Lakin was teaching down at the American Fort campus and at other schools and is sort of the fruit of one of our administrative trees. Uh, Charnay Adams is one of our administrators there, so they have education in the home, around the table, and she's going to be an extraordinary asset to this campus. She's an alumna of American Heritage School, so she went through as a student, and she's going to make it even better than what she experienced down there, right? <laughs> When I'm a teacher, I'm going to change this. Lake is glad to have you. Okay, I can just go on and on about all. And I have interviewed personally, along with Leland, all of these. If I haven't, it's just a matter of timing, maybe one or two here, but I haven't. And just felt instantly. It doesn't take that long in an interview setting to get a sense for the light and the love that someone has for children and the Lord and education. It doesn't take a half hour. It takes about five minutes, and you can tell which candidates feel called to teach. I'm not talking about a priesthood calling. We get the fifth article of faith around here. We're not the church. We haven't been set apart to be teachers. We're, we're doing all of this of our own volition, and you can tell when a teacher feels called to teach. That's who we have here. This is the Miley family. Did I say that name right? Are the Miley's here this morning? So, um, Mrs. Miley is going to work in the front office. Mr. Miley is going to be on our security team. Shane, you just met. He led the um, he led the pledge of allegiance. There he is, our security director. Uh, we have we get that safety is a very important thing for a downtown metropolitan campus. This is going to be the safest campus in the world, I promise. <laughs> it's going to be more safe than the American Ford campus, that's for sure. Uh, Salt Lake is not Utah County. And, 
And it's not just about all the cameras that we're going to have everywhere and the fences and the physical security. It's people. It's people who really create safety. We're going to have constant, at least too deep supervision all the time, including when we walk over to Temple Square campus for field trips and around town. There's going to be lots of safety mechanisms in place to make sure that your children are coming to school and they feel inspired and like they're rising to a better self, but they are also safe. Okay? Dan Miley, I was getting to this, Dan Miley is a security officer for the church. His children are here. This is a picture from the Days of 47th parade. Did anyone see the American Air School float going down? <laughs> okay. So Dan Miley is going to be on our security team as well here. Is it okay for me to mention this, Leland? So welcome to school. We give families homework. Uh, we are going to ask that all of you read these basic documents, okay, mother booklets, little books. In addition to everything else we give you to read, some of you are like, what did we sign up for here? What, we're doing like training at 7 in the morning? Or, okay, okay. Um, this is an old copy, but we do have foundations guides that are coming for you. Um, and uh, the foundations guide really has incorporated this second one, which is, uh, it's called the NOAA Plan and the Principal Approach. The Principal Approach to Education is a method where we start with principles, and then dates and facts and figures all flow from that. It's a moral instruction, a values-oriented kind of education, okay? Good pictures, bad pictures, and tech-wise families. Look, we are all living in a world where we and our children are swimming in tech. And it is almost overwhelming. And we want not just the students to understand responsible use of technology, we want families to understand that. That's where the strength is, it's in the home. And so we're creating a whole community of families that get this. That keeps everyone safe. And if you ask me, if you want to ask me what the real risk to safety is, it's not, it's not a homeless individual who's mentally ill. That, I think that's a lot easier to protect our children from than the parade of horribles that come from the danger online. One in five children is sexually abused by the time they're 18. Self-reported. Most of which comes from a pornography-originated problem that somebody had or much of it, I should say most. So, this is also safety. And I think you'll love this book, Tech Wise Families. Lots of great common sense and also faith-oriented guidance for families with lots of data in it as well, okay? All right. Strategic issues facing homes and schools. You can read faster than I can talk. It's a tough world out there. I think that's the summer, right? Um, this is 2019. Findings and data assembled by the National Association of Independent Schools. Um, since 2019, not only do we continue to have those issues, but there are more that are new. And you start to wonder, why school districts and schools and homes are just sort of ripping apart at the foundations. There's a lot of opposition out there. It's a tough world to grow up in. You haven't read this Atlantic piece that was published a few years ago. Really, really interesting about this technology environment in which we are all sort of swimming, right? But I don't want any of us to think that this is going to be a school that has sort of this, you know, world view that everything is going to hell in a handbasket. That's the red line going down. And some, some, you know, I think sometimes especially in faith circles where they're concerned, faith communities where they're, they're concerned about, you know, this sort of sense that, that the world is getting more wicked or whatever it is, right? And that's not the way we view the world. That's not our worldview as a school. This middle line is a different kind of view of children, families, and society, which is, oh, you know, it's sort of, 
the world is sort of the same that it's always been. That there's some ups and there's some downs and there's cycles of violence and wickedness, but overall, it's, the world really hasn't changed that much. That's the middle line. We have this optimistic view of children and families and the world, which is, this is a great time to be alive. This is the most wonderful age in the history of this planet. There is so much hope and light and opportunity. The technology itself has enabled so much health and happiness. But it's also a time, if you, you, know, if you think about it, with all of that magnification going on, there are times that are really hard. Good is magnified and evil is magnified in this world. That's what technology has done. That's what information has done. It's magnified things. So there are some pretty steep drops that feel pretty bad sometimes. But overall, this world, this generation, this is a fullness of times. And that is wonderful. A fullness of good and light. And yes, fullness of evil, but if you ask me if I could have chosen when to come, I would come in the fullness. How awesome is that? Right? Okay. Let's go way back. 18, excuse me, 18. Well, we'll go back to the 1800s in just a minute here. This is 1969. Verlin Anderson. He's a professor at BYU. He's Stanford educated, Harvard educated. He is a teacher at the BY High, which Dallin H. Oaks graduated from and many others. At the time, there was a K-12 faith-oriented school in Provo called BY Academy and BY High. And the church decided, we can't provide this for everyone around the world, so we're gonna close it. And the church started closing its institutes, or excuse me, its academies, and it had some. It had some in New Zealand, it, uh, ben in Benito in Mexico, the church started closing these academies. Verlin, one of the teachers at the BY Academy, which is now the Provo Library, beautiful, said, "Okay, I support what the church is doing there, but we would love to keep this going for our children." And he was actually a member of the Quorum of Seventy at the time, so he did very much support the church. He gets it, right? can't provide this for everyone, so let's just not try and provide it for anyone. That was kind of philosophy. And he said, well, let's keep it going for our children on a private basis. And the church said, great. There's a chapel in Pleasant Grove. We're going to demolish it. It's old. If you want to keep the BY High going in BY Academy, you just go ahead and buy that chapel from the church and make it independent of the church. And that's where American Heritage started. We started in a chapel just like this in Pleasant Grove called it American Heritage School. American Heritage because they strongly believed there was something miraculous. There was a miracle in the American founding that was connected, heart and mind, to the miracle at Bethlehem. That the founders, the American experiment, which used the Bible as the political textbook for this new form of law and government, that there really was a connection with Christianity. So we call it the School of American Heritage because we believe it pulls together the best of who we are, not just as a country or as a Latter-day Saint people, but as a world. American Heritage School. And I want you to listen to Gaylord Swim, who is um, one of the men who allowed the school, let's see if I can play this here for you, to continue when it was on the financial rocks in 1980. The school was about to close. It, it was had a great mission. It just didn't have a lot of great business leadership going on. And so he helped to shore it up. Listen to what he said as they dedicated the American Fort Campus, because they moved from that old chapel to the American Fort Campus. His family and foundation donated enough to purchase 10 acres. It's grown to 40 since then. But listen to his vision in 2005, shortly before he passed away, 2002, excuse me, shortly before he passed away of an unexpected uh, brain tumor. Okay, listen to this. Oh, uh, Jay told me not to try this, but I'm going to try it.
It's okay. I will play this for you at the all parent meeting. I really want you to hear this, and I'm out of time anyway. So, let me do this. Let me just... Let me just maybe conclude here. Um, putting our faith-oriented mission aside, just talking about independent schools. Um, I think you can see here that there's a lot of value to being in an environment where we can choose the teachers, we can choose the curriculum, we can hire and fire at will, not just teachers, but students who don't support the vision. We don't need to keep obstructionists in the classroom. Choice, agency, is such a powerful bedrock upon which to build a school environment, right? And you can see that it has statistical evidence in the broader education realm. But there is also a great value that we bring to that even as a faith-oriented school of doing some of these kinds of things we have no debt as a school. We want to keep it that way. Um, if, you, if you wonder why we haven't fixed a few things here and there, it's because we're not going to go into debt to do it. And this campus will grow and become more beautiful and facilitated. We'll build additional buildings, I'm sure, in time. The church has even offered us additional property as we grow. Um, but we're not going to do it with debt. And we have some very clear strategy and priorities. Okay, I'm just going to put a pin in it right there. Um, Leland, thank you for giving me a little bit of time. I am gonna stay with you for most of the morning. I'll need to leave uh, late morning, but thank you for taking a chance on, on American Heritage School. Thank, we know you have lots of good options. We know that there are good public and private options in Salt Lake. We need you to make this one the best. We're doing this all together. Um, so, again, thank you for all that you're doing, late mornings, early nights, um, and we'll look forward to Tuesday. Gonna be a big cannon fire that day, right? We got permission to fire the cannon in downtown Salt Lake. Okay, good. All right. Thank you, Brandon, for a wonderful presentation, a great survey. Let's give you just two minutes to stand up and stretch, just for a moment.
Okay, on your chairs or at the back, you should have a couple of documents here. One is the mission statement and the seven principles. It's on a half sheet of paper, so that's probably on your seat. If you don't have that, that's okay. Uh, you also have a document that looks like this. It's a two-page stable document. It's got some lines uh, on the front side, and then on the back there are just some notes. We're going to use the front side primarily. So if you could find that and pull out a pen, that would be great, or a pencil, or borrow one. I'm going to try to make this uh, as interesting and as interactive as possible. We've got a full mission statement, probably the longest mission statement of any school you've ever seen. 178 words or something like that. Uh, and we're going to go through all of that. And I hope that by the end of this time that you will, um, of course, love the mission statement even more and be ready to talk about why it's so important in your own life to others, to your children, especially to your children at home. So if you haven't read the mission statement, we're going to do that too. Uh, we won't do it um, out loud. Again, please find a partner or be close because I'm going to want you to talk quite a bit. The first, uh, but before I do that, let me just show you a couple of things. I know some of you are dying to know just a little bit about the building and what's going to happen out there. So let me give you just two or three minutes on that and then we'll jump into the mission statement. Of course, this building has gone under, undergone a lot of change. This is back in July. We've since taken off the steeple and filled in the font. That was something President Nelson said. We have to fill in the font and take off the steeple. This is my family. Actually, it's missing one daughter. My daughter, who was on her mission at the time, has come home. And this morning, this daughter goes into the MTC to go to tai Taiwan. Both were called to Taiwan. No surprise, we're living in China. And I guess they both knew enough Mandarin uh, that they're both calling Chinese speaking. This is the Chinese school that I mentioned, the RDF International School. Delightful school in Shenzhen, which is just next to Hong Kong. Beautiful, balmy, southern China. If you get a chance to go to China, Invite me, I'll take you on a great tour. It's wonderful, okay? <laughs> um, I did go to BYU and also to Harvard University uh, for my master's degree. Um, I don't like to say that, but I put that on here because uh, people have wondered sometimes. And I actually think that the universities here in, U in Utah are every bit as good. Maybe you want your children to go to Harvard and we'll try to help them, or Stanford, or Yale. Uh, however, my experience is that the light and truth at BYU, at the University of Utah, especially in the institute programs, those who are trying to live the faith of their fathers, is just as brilliant. I never met people more brilliant than the people I met who are full of faith, full of the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that were diligently striving, including the BYUs and the local universities here in Utah. We're not trying to get you into to BYU either, although incidentally, most of our students, at least at Utah County, try to go to BYU. And about 70% of them get in when they apply, which is a very high admissions rate. Okay, here's, a, uh, as was mentioned, we have three campuses. We've grown to about 7,000 students. The largest is our worldwide. We have approximately 5,000 plus students in 50 states and about 60 countries pre pandemic. I don't know what the number is right now. Grant is our head of school. Chase is the principal of the American Fort Campus, which is a flagship campus, 40 acres. About 1,100, 1,200 students almost in American Fork. We're starting here with about 100, we're hoping to be at 115 students next Tuesday, somewhere in that ballpark, here on the Salt Lake City campus. We have capacity to grow here up to 300 students over the next three years. We're K through nine, we'll add grade 10 next year, grade 11, and then grade 12. And so our first graduating class will be three years from now, with somewhere up to 300 students on this campus. Uh, as was mentioned, potentially we could build, we could remodel this campus, we could have another campus or have another building. If you know people who can come to these campuses, of course, our hope is that, um, that they'll be able to. But if they can't, then we've got a worldwide program that really provides some excellent curriculum. And we're starting family education centers, which are organized cooperative learning groups all around the world as well. 
Our Salt Lake campus has a, an advisory board. These are some of those advisory board members. Dan, who is the advisor, he's actually the board chair for the entire institution, is also the chair of the Salt Lake City Advisory Board. He cares a lot about this campus and its success. Hal Roy, thanks for joining us. He's also on our advisory board. Uh, uh, Mr. Gerlock, uh, Gerlock, David Warner, an artistic prod prodigy, really connected with downtown Salt Lake City here in the Roman Tabernacle, the Tabernacle Choir in the Square. Uh, Shannon Asman Norton, David Sterling, who actually just left on a mission from Armenia. Uh, so he's um, going to be just kind of a very, very distant advisor, but he's very interested in the success of the school, so he's remaining. And then Ralph Lauderman, who is a piano professor up at Weber State. Okay, let's. Um, Look at this document, this image, just for a moment. This is Clayton Christensen's Tools of Cooperation and Change. We're going to come back to it um, in a few minutes. What you'll see here, though, I'm going to just introduce it to you, is the extent to which people agree on what they want, and the extent to which people agree on cause and effect, meaning how things should be done. You can't see that there, but that's his cause and effect as well. So if there's, of course, in our, in our families, we'd like to always agree and always agree on how things should be done. Wouldn't that be sweet? That's called the Zion Quadrant. Actually, he doesn't call it that. He says this is, this, this is really the sweet spot where you have high agreement on what you want and high agreement on how to get there, right? The tools that work in that are very different from when you have low agreement on what you want and low agreement on how to get there, right? The only tools that work there are what we call power tools, fiat, conversion, threats, right? All the war-torn areas of the world are struggling because they don't agree on what they want or how to get it. Sometimes when you have great leadership and charisma and role modeling, you can pull people into a higher level of what they want. And then if you add tools like training and standard operating procedures and measurement systems and strategic planning, you can pull them over to how things should be done. But the sweet spot is when you agree not just on how to do things, right? You can, we have subcontractors here, right? Who could maybe not agree on what we want, but so long as they agree on how to do it, and we get along okay. Being a subcontractor or a contractor, that's okay, right? And maybe some feel-good meetings are, are wonderful too. But having both of them, where you are enjoying the, the, the spirit of democracy, the spirit of participation, right? The spirit of tradition and rituals and folklore, the spirit of religion, even. Being of one heart and one mind is something that we all yearn for in our homes, in our communities, in our nations, in the world, right? And so these are the kinds of tools that work in your home when you're trying to create a beautiful family culture for multiple generations, having those rituals so family prayer, family scripture study, family home eating, saying roses, buds, and thorns around the, the kitchen table, right? Having <laughs> wonderful bedtime hugs, little prayers with your children. All those kinds of rituals or traditions can be wonderful. Family, family vacations, um, having participation, family councils. Maybe it's not a democracy, right? It's not in my family. It's kind of a benevolent, you know, parents are in charge still, but we like to get a lot of counsel input from our children. <laughs> And sometimes we do let them make the choices, right? But having that kind of participation makes a big difference. And having unity around uh, our understanding of God and His plan for us makes a big difference as well. So this, the school, can do some of these things too. And, it, and that's our goal, right? Partly. I'd like you to start now by turning to your um, the mission statement. The mission statement starts out like this. It says, American Heritage School exists, or assists rather, assists parents worldwide in developing the hearts, minds, and bodies of students to realize their divine potential by doing seven things. We're going to take the next 30 minutes and we're going to break down those seven things. But first, turn to your neighbor and for one minute talk about why it's important that the school assist you. We assist you. Why is that important? Okay, one minute, ready, go. Talk, talk, talk. Thank 
know that's kind of a deep question, but I want you to be able to discuss this. Why should they want to build the kingdom of God on earth? See if you can get a noodle on that. That question is actually on page two if you want. Um, you can see some of my notes there. But why should they want to? One minute to discuss. Ready? Begin. Mm -hmm. So I guess I jumped the gun. I should have said, raise your hand if you want your children to be useful in the hands of the Lord and the Lord the of God. Do you? Raise your hand. I do. Yeah, right? And why? Why do we want them to, or why should they even desire that? Anyone have a comment? If you don't, that's fine. You don't have a whole lot of time for more than about one comment each. Go ahead, Mrs. Tonight. Exactly. Without vision, the people perish. Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law happy is he, the scriptures say. Great. So happiness. You want them to be truly happy. Because what happens when you're not focused on good things like building the kingdom of God on earth? We have a beautiful painting in this building. Now, actually, I want to let you answer that question. What happens when we are focused on building God's kingdom? Yes. So I think we live in an interesting world where everything's high. With the iPhone, the iPad, the I, 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 I. And when we give our kids a big vision, they look beyond the eyes and they start seeing how they can bless other people. And that is the thing of God. That's right. It's not so much. God will shape us. <coughs> That's right. I love the scripture. It's one of my favorite. Genesis 68, 67 and 68. If your eye be single to my glory, which is to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life, amen. Your whole body shall be filled with light. And I think you and I all know that. We know people who are filled with light. And why are they filled with light? Because they are godly men and women who have his eye, his, his glory as their single focus, right? Maybe they have to go to work and do some things that maybe aren't, but they're always thinking about how can I build others? How can I lift others like Jesus Christ did? Always about them. Always about bringing people to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost. Okay, well, God grants unto people according to their desires. He's going to give it to you. Alma 29.1. He's just going to give you what you desire. And so we want to change your students in some ways by helping them to want to build the kingdom of God. If they want that, if they get their attitudes right, there's an acronym, ASK, A-S-K. Attitudes, skills, knowledge. If we can help them have the attitudes, of wanting to know Jesus Christ and be used in his hands. They will then be driven to get the skills and the knowledge. They will be filled with the light of skills and knowledge because they want, they desire to build the kingdom of God. Well, I hope you know that's part of our mission. It's part of my mission. And how do we do that? Well, lots of ways. One way is, you know, we have devotionals in the morning. We encourage you to have devotionals in your own home. Please make it a habit to pray with your kids every day, morning and night. You probably are. Right? We can all maybe do a little better sometimes. I don't know, right? Please make it a habit to read scriptures with your children, to have good discussions about those, to testify, to teach them. 
We'll do that at our school too. TTIP, Teach, Testify, Invite, Promise. It's a very simple four-letter acronym. Teach your children, testify to them, invite them, kindly love them to do good things, promise them blessings, and teach them to do that for each other. That's a great uh, part of this. Also, never to be forgotten truths. Your children will make records of middle one-line principles. Just they stick. They have a long shelf life. Like these, right? When we tasted the fruit of the tree of life, and we trace goodness, it's so sweet to us that we want to share with others. That's, that's the essence of charity, isn't it? To eat that fruit and want to share it with others. Um, and many others, hundreds of little one-liners, never to be forgotten truths, principles. Um, we'll move on to just a second. Elder... See, Richard G. Scott said, a principle is a concentrated truth packaged for application to a wide variety of circumstances. A principle is a concentrated truth packaged for application to a wide variety of circumstances. That's, I think, a powerful definition. And I hope that principles, concentrated truths, packaged for application to a wide variety of circumstances will become a major focus in your home. It certainly will be here at the school. And if it is in your home, we're going to get this kind of outcome where it's like accelerated fast to the top, right? Okay? That's why I love this analogy so quick, so well. This is um, two trees, same, same variety. One gets a little bit more light. Same water. This actually is an experiment that was a natural experiment, not intended, in the yard of Randall L. Ridd, who about 10 years ago was the second counselor in General Young's men's presidency. He left on a three-year mission. He planted two trees, same type, same ground, same everything, except one got a little more sunlight, maybe. One got, I'd like to see. Well, and of course, over three years, this is the difference. Tremendous difference. And I, what's the difference? What's the light? What's the light in your homes? Talk for just 30 seconds about that. What's the difference to make this happen in your homes? 30 seconds, again. Anyone want to say? Yeah. I don't know what the difference is. There are probably a hundred ways. To, I do know the difference. It's, it's the light of Jesus Christ. It's the Holy Ghost that bears witness of the Father and the Son. It is living in the Spirit, walking with God daily. Now, the number one way to get that Spirit is to start doing certain things and to stop doing other things, right? What should we start and what should we stop? What should you stop at home? Contention. Avoid contention at all costs. Avoid it at all costs, right? Never, 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 never make a big deal about anything. Actually, I don't know. You have to make a big deal about something. But most things should fall to the ground in silence. Brigham Young said that we speak and it's like fruit. And if we speak, when we have pain or anxiety or other problems in our lives, and we want to cast that on other people and, you know, blame them, right? it's kind of a negative fruit. And most of the time, we should just let that fall to the ground unnoticed. But when we have delicious fruit to praise, we should speak it all we can, right? Journal discourse is breaking up. I, I hope that we all will avoid contention at all costs in our, at all costs in our home and try to make a big deal about the good things. Praise your children specifically from your effort, talk to them about Christ at home, and do everything you can so that you can have light at home. We're going to do that at school. We're going to have a dedicatory session after we finish that last building. We haven't finished our chapel. I think we're going to wait about a month until that's done, because that is the other way, right? You've got to teach our children to be like Joseph Smith, to seek to hear him. The grove, the wilderness, Jesus went to the wilderness, Mark 135, the great well before day, he rose up and departed into a solitary place, and there prayed. Right? Nephi went into the mountain. Joseph went into the grove. Jesus said, go into your closets. We should do that. We should go with pens and paper. We should go with prayer. You should teach your children to do that. You should do it yourself. Right? That's how we're going to have this kind of growth. 
That's why Joseph Smith grew like this. He was checking out every book from heaven by asking, 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 and he got, got, got. Right? He received life upon life and revelation upon revelation. Okay, mission number two. Why else do we exist? I'm probably going to get through four or five of these. I've got to cut this off pretty soon. But five, six and seven are really well my question. Okay, number two. Why should students desire to increase faith in and knowledge of the plan of salvation? That's our second goal. One minute talk about it. Why should, it's kind of related, so we'll make this one brief. Why should they increase their faith in and knowledge of the plan of salvation? Why? Ready? Talk. One minute. Loud and clear. said, this, Andersons, is the past, right? All this dirt that, or sand that had fallen down, right? This is the future, and this is the present. And we talked about why that's important. And later on, I was discussing this with my sister and others, and we kind of said, we should live in the present, right? Because what happens when we live in the past too much? Redo, reliving the glory days, or we're reliving those grudges, right? And it's not happy because we're stuck in the past. And if we live in the future, I'll be happy when oh, I just need to get this next job, or right? If only these problems could be resolved, then I'll be happy. Well, then we're not also happy. So we generally need to live in the present. But what about when the present's painful? Like your child is crying at you and throwing a tantrum. <laughs> then what do you need to do? You gotta remember the plan of salvation. You gotta remember that in the past you were like that too. And in the future, they will not be like that. That they're going through a phase. That there's this big picture perspective. You can draw strength from the past or the present, or the, sorry, or the future as well. Right? They need to know the plan of salvation. They need to know that Jesus Christ came to rescue them all. They have to know that as the kingpin, right? The key pillars of the, the plan of salvation. They need to know that you know, the, the God did all of this. That right? all things to know there's a God. He's our creator, our father. He's our and, and he's going to give us, if we give him our all, he'll give us his all, right? If we will live for it, right? So we need to, to have that plan of salvation. We talk about that here. I'm so glad we can. 
when we're talking about history and literature and other great people who came to Earth for a time such as this, or whatever time they lived in, and had a mission for a time such as this, or whatever time they lived in, and made a contribution. And now your children can say, well, what will my contribution be? Instead of me getting stuck in you know, some me, 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 iPhone kind of focus uh, or addiction, I'm here for a purpose, to make the world a better place. And part of this plan of salvation was that I came to Earth to do something. However small my one twelfth teaspoon of honey may be, right? I get to make a little honey on Earth. Let me know right? Okay. Number three, how can students in our classrooms and homes increase their oh we've done that. Sorry, how can they do that? Well, plant seeds, the word of God, and then Mission number three, statement number three, why should students develop a love understanding and appreciation for America and the founding fathers? Talk for one minute about that. Why do we care about America and its founding fathers? I have a British vice principal. We broke away from Britain. We have Australian teachers. They broke away from Britain. Right? Sorry. I don't know. Why do we care about America? Right? And the founding fathers. One minute. Ready? Go. of dream and for chances to be able to grow as a community. And for what I know, Washington was very religious and he actually prayed to God any time that he has to do any, any kind of uh, leading or anything like that. He was, he was always carrying his Bible and prayed to Heavenly Father. So they, they create America under God. You know, they trust into him. Thank you. One more comment. Yeah, Dr. Cummings states, I've, I've raised men up for this very purpose to found this country that were, they could be a restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right. Period. Right. They have to know that. They have to believe. They have to stand up for the flag. It's, it's part of even our, our religion, our culture. Uh, it's what we've all died for. Right. Liberty here is not flag waving, just. Um, you know, cannon firing, and uh, we've got fireworks on this 15th of September, come down to the, that's not just the depth of our patriotism, right? It's actually about, I like the root of patriot means actually father, right? P-A-T-R, patra means, in the Latin, means father, right? It's the plan of the father to have his children be free. And in DNC 101, not just 79 and 80 where it says that God raised up, you know, these men under this very purpose. It says in the verse before that that it's not right that people should be in bondage one to another. And it says, sorry, I took that this verse. Okay, it says, DNC 101, um, 76. Seven, according to the laws and constitution of the people, which I have suffered to be established and should be maintained for the rights and protection of all flesh, according to just and holy principles. That, and when you see that in the scriptures, it usually means so that. 
so that every man may act in doctrine and principle pertaining to maturity according to the moral agency which I have given unto man. That, meaning so that, every man may be accountable for his own sins in the day of judgment. God wants us all to be accountable. If we're in slavery, can we be accountable? Less so. If we're in a very heavily authoritarian regi regime, government, where we don't have as much choice, can we be accountable? Less so. Right? God wants all of his children to have agency so they can learn for themselves. And the gospel of Jesus Christ had to flower in a place where people could choose it. And that's why America is so important. Right? So many constitutions around the world have been based on, and of course at some point, the Heavenly Father will send his son Jesus Christ again and he will reign as King of Kings and Lord of Lords and there will be a new government upon his shoulders. But this is a predecessor of some sorts and it's to maximize agency so people can actually choose right, and learn. And we can maximize the value of the ability to learn on this earth. I've seen that. I've been in places where the freedom of the press, freedom of religion are restricted. And I know that um, it matters. So we're going to teach your children to love America and love agency. Okay? And you should too. Mission number five, number four, I'm going to just skim and then we'll do one more number five and then I'm going to stop and number six and seven will kind of be part of the same thing that you'll get in the next session. Number five, four says, why should we help them desire to make self-education a lifelong pursuit? Why should we learn? Yeah, it keeps us growing and progressing. What's that? Yeah. God knows an awful lot, doesn't he? <laughs> we're there, to, we're here to learn, to become, and um, we should learn as much as possible. You know, uh, Yale and Harvard and Princeton, all of those areas were founded by Puritans who studied the Bible diligently. They studied because they wanted to know the truth. They studied so well they wanted to purify the Anglican church, right? They had a thirst for knowledge. We are descendants, many of them, from those. But even if we're not, we should have that same thirst for knowledge because whatever principle of intelligence we attain unto in this life rises with us in the resurrection. You know that how much you learn and your children learn affects tomorrow. And it affects next year and the next decade and the end of your life. So if you want your children to have as much liberty, as much agency as possible, they've got to learn as much as possible. My dad, when we were young, told us this little idea of, if you want to spend your whole life on a skateboard, you can. But if you're a little bit more obedient, you can drive a car. You just have to pass the test and follow the rules. And if you're more obedient than that, you can go fly a plane. Right? Pass the test and learn the rules. Obedience to truth, that learning the rules and regulations actually makes you free. My sister can encapsulate that in a nice little book she wrote. And it's really delightful how she told it. That was my dad teaching me when we were young. Guess what? Obedience and knowledge make you free. It's not drudgery. Homework's not drudgery. This is going to make you free. So we teach your kids to hopefully love learning, to, to want to be free through knowledge, and to want to be able to exist for others through knowledge. God knows everything so he can exist for us. Knowledge is not so you can make money. Except that the less money is going to help you liberate the captain and you know, make, make people free. Right? And so you can exist for others. So you can establish a happy multi generational family and bring as many people to the same state of loving God and loving Christ and loving truth as you are. Okay, let's go to number five and we'll do this and then I'm going to conclude. So number five says Why should we teach our children to reason and discern between right, wrong, truth, and error? Why should we do that? One minute to discuss, and we'll discuss for three minutes, and then I'm done. Okay, we'll take a break.
Okay. Ten seconds. Okay. So one of our missions here in the schools to teach your children to discern between right and wrong, truth and error. Why is that important? Or why should why should we want that for our children? Here, go ahead. Gravity is the same here and in Mexico and in China and everywhere. Gravity doesn't doesn't change, right? You can break yourself on gravity. You can make a lot of money with gravity too, if you're hiding with your dams or you know, something like that, right? But, or it can kill you, right? Truth is truth, it changes not. Yeah, great. What else? One other news, one other comment. Yes, please. Want them, I think all of us want our children to be able to leave the house and be able to discern right and wrong, truth and error on their own. And how can we do that? Well, I'd encourage you. There's lots of ways to do that. Yes? I think it also helps um, our children to um, be able to tell the difference between right and wrong, truth and error. Right. Because yeah. they know that they're going to be judged. Yeah. Can you give an example? You want to expand? We're going to help your child children do that. Research from primary sources, read for themselves, understand cause and effect. Right? What are the effects? How does A lead to B and B leads to C and C leads to B? And that's why A leads to B, right? Yes. Three R's, we call them the four R's. Or four R's, research, reason, relate, record. That's one way we're going to do it. Teach your children to research, meaning examine and accept, especially from primary sources and experience. We're going to teach them to reason from cause to effect through syllogistic reasoning, like A, if A then B, and if B then C, and if C then B, so therefore if A then B, right? For example, well, why does knowing the truth make you free? Because if you know the truth, you know how things really are. If you know how things really are, then you know how, uh, you know, the effects of certain choices. And if you know the effects of choices, then you can choose better choices. And if you can choose better choices, then you can avoid negative choices. And if you avoid negative choices, then you're free to not suffer the consequences of those negative choices. So therefore you're free. That's why knowing the truth makes you free, right? You see that syllogistic reason. So we're gonna teach your children a lot of that. And you can do it out of the scriptures. Christ, go study the, old, the, the Sermon on the Mount, just a little homework assignment. Matthew 5 to 7, he does all sorts of contrasts too. Right? It has been said this, but I say this. It has been said that, but I say this, it's actually through all five chapters, not just where it says something. Look for it, except for in the Beatitudes. But right after the Beatitudes, it's like one after the other. Compare and contrast, compare and contrast. Not A, but B. And that helps you discern too. And then you can discuss why. All right. Well, I love you. I love teaching and learning. I love our teachers. You can have a great experience here. The children are going to thrive. They're going to be like this tree on the right. We're going to do our best. We need to partner so that we can hit the yoke at the same time, so we can all be pulling in the same direction. And I promise if you do that, your children will see remarkable growth. They will not be, um, and actually you will see remarkable growth, even over days and weeks, and certainly over months and years, you see that. And this is the kind of teaching that um, I expect all of our teachers to do, and we encourage and train, teach and train and help all of our teachers do, so they can make these kinds of deep connections and the spirit can bear with us. And I'm going to share this with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Okay. Take a one minute. No, let's take a five minute break. There is a restroom here if you need to. Um, go down. It's just on the outside here. We have some snacks in the back. In five minutes, we'll start doing it. This is going to be my day.
I love the culture, um, cultures that we can share, um, just to enhance our lives. Um, and I think um, there is. Oh, okay. um, I love this this painting um, from Amber Eldridge, um, and I just love the idea of the patchwork, patchwork quilt work. Sorry, of um, of the Savior and how he ties us all together. And she always adds. Um, some comments to her to her artwork, and I just love this, this that she says, "And um, his light is the thread that brings us together, that brings all our pains and sorrows together, 
stitches them whole, light that doesn't erase but mends, that creates beauty from pieces, wholeness from difference. He gathers us in one piece, one soul at a time, weaves us together into an inseparable whole. And I love the fact that we've got all these different nationalities, but we're joined together by our love of America. Um, it's fine, I, I appreciate America, don't worry. Um, and, um, and our love of Christian values and our love of the Savior. And I really do love that, um, that that's what ties us, that's what unites us. Um, and so I am going to be talking about seven principles of American heritage. And these principles help us to lay that foundation for our children so that they can research, they can reason, that they can apply those principles and recognize those principles in their lives um, and really helps them to, to kind of move forward to be um, happy and successful. Um, I am going to do a little bit of a um, classroom style technique right now. I was talk talking to Megan last night and we were just talking about how many acronyms there are and I'm new to the school as well so we we're all in it together um, and I, it just dawned on me, I mean, how, how, many have, uh, how many parents have students who know American heritage really well? You, you've, you've kind of either been or your students have been in American heritage, is there anyone? I don't think there is. One, two, okay. Um, so here's another question then. Until today, or maybe until you have, hands up if you feel really confident knowing what 4R is. 4R. Okay, yeah, cool, yeah, great. <laughs> so not that many. And so I feel it's really important that we understand what our children are going to be learning. I say our children because they are ours. It takes a village. We were just talking about that earlier, that it takes a village um, to raise children, and we want to help you um, with that uh, and work with you. And so this is taken from the foundation training booklet that you will receive. And uh, Leland already mentioned it, so research, reason, relate, and record. Um, and they will be um, looking at these aspects and, and practicing them within the classroom. And so we've had training as, as staff as well. We've been looking at how we're going to implement that throughout the curriculum. And bear with me, I will get to the principles, but this is just laying the groundwork. So um, we're going to be talking about the seven principles of personal and civil liberty, which are our principles. And like I said, it helps us to be happy and successful. And I don't mean success. There's lots of ways we can measure success. Yes, money, good job, that's great. Um, it helps us to help other people. Um, but we also want to, to love life. That's, that's what we're here for, to have joy. Um, and so there are many ways that we can measure happiness and success, and we want our students to be able to experience all that that, can, that entails. So a lot of our students, we use the Noel Webster 1828 uh, dictionary, and we use that because it, it brings in Christian aspects as well. Um, and so I, I looked it up. This is the definition of principle. Um, and so I would just like you just to kind of that's a lot, you don't have to read all of that. But just kind of, I've, I've highlighted some key words that stuck out to me. So you might want to read um, those uh, numbers, those sentences, just thinking about well, what, what is a principle? What do we mean by principle? Um, so I'm just gonna give you a few seconds to, to do that. And I, I just want you to think, is there anything that stands out to you with this definition? Is there anything that you think, oh, I like that, and that you can gain a, a, a principle from? Line, to establish firmly in the mind. I like that as well. Um, and that really helps, doesn't it? When you know the principle, that helps you really establish firmly. Tahani, did you have another one? Another three? Being that produces anything, operative cause. The soul of a man is an active principle. What do you like about that? Resonating. Yeah. I think, and that kind of works with the idea of that from which things proceed. Right? Um, um, it's not a passive aspect, it's, it's something that is cause and effect. 
And um, I came to my, my, my mind as the foundation. Um, it helps justify, it helps us give reason, it helps to serve as a rule, as a guidance. And so principles are important. I would like, so, so your students, our students, your children, our children, um, will be thinking about well, how, where are we going to find that, that research? Where are we going to find a source, a primary source of information with whatever topics that we're studying? And so it might be that they turn to the scriptures or conference talks or, or other aspects of primary sources. So I would love, like some of you, hopefully you'll have scriptures on your phones or maybe just talk with amongst each other, just in small groups. Um, I would like you to maybe think of the scriptures. Does the scripture come to mind where you can think of principles, where principle is mentioned? Um, if you can't think of one, I've got a quote here from Richard D. Scott, Scott that you can also use. Um, but if you can think of something else, then by all means, please, I want to hear any other scriptures that you can think of, or conference talks, or, or just some, some truth or research. And when you're discussing, I want you to think about what principles of truth are you learning from that information. I'm just going to give you maybe two minutes. Okay. Don't be shy, just get into groups. Great. I bet you didn't think you were coming to a classroom today. <laughs> um, anyone, um, anyone like to share some thoughts or something that's come to mind? Are you brave enough? You've been Mr. Shows have been volunteered. <laughs> would be the Articles of Faith, and if you could just summarize in one sentence, what principle, if there was one principle that you wouldn't want anyone to, to misunderstand in just one sentence, what would it be about that? Um, about so, principle of truth, about principles, I know it's a bit of a... <laughs> um, I love that, truth that anchor your lives, and you can have... Yes. some differences between doctrine and principles. The doctrine is that Jesus is the Christ, right? That Jesus suffered for all of our sins. 
right? That we are free. We are children of God. Those are true statements about the way the world is. And principles, that's also, you know, you could say the principles and doctrines are similar, that they're, they're the same. But sometimes we talk about principles as things like honesty or integrity, right? And those are more actionable applications in some ways. Like, when you're honest, people can trust you. That's a simple statement which you can record, you can crystallize, and I'm honest, people will trust me more, right? That, that's kind of a, an actionable principle. Um, maybe it's not a doctrine, well, it kind of is a doctrine, but, you know, anyway, I think you distinguish them that way about statements of truth about the plan of salvation and about the way God has created this wonderful world and universe. And then also actionable statements that can be a useful distinction for some. Thank you. So actionable statements, statements of truth, anchors. Um, so there's so many already different principles of truth that we're learning just in this discussion about the importance of principles. And I'd just like you to think for a second, how can you apply that to your life? You don't have to share it, just you know, think about it yourself. How can you apply these principles of truth um, to your life? Or how have you already applied that to your life? And if, any, actually, if anyone would like to share, that would be wonderful. But if not, it's quite a personal question. Yes. I have a little thought. I was just wondering how different um, action items or principles can uh, sort of contrast and compare in a way that defines the narrow path of discipleship. I, like, we are taught to let our light so shine, but do not our arms before men. And when we take those in conjunction, they can help us define the narrow path depending on circumstances. Or the one that's been on my mind is doubt not that be believing, but we're also to take heed that no man deceive you. And so taking these guiding principles just help us find that the narrow chosen or path in whatever context we're in. I love that. Thank you. The narrow truth of our path. And, and when we're able to think about that and apply that to our lives, we're able to, whatever circumstance we, we may find ourselves in, we're able to think about that, think about principles of truth, and think about, um, does, this, does this mirror what I've, what I've learned? And so in the classroom, I'm just going to go back real quick to... Uh, oh, yes, go for it. I don't want to, uh, to have kind of too narrowly defined principles. Sometimes just the statement, for example, that, that Jesus Christ loves me, that, that is a true doctrine, but it also is the foundation or something from which springs so many other wonderful truths, right? So, uh, Perfect, thank you. Oh, Sarah. I was just going to say that um, when Jesus says that he loves you, Um, and, and so this concept of, this concept, and, and obviously this is just a, a real, note to self, don't play with the chord, okay, um, so, um, so this is just a small taste of, of what your students will be experiencing as we, and I hope, and just because of time, it is just a small, small taste of it, but already we've been starting to unpick and think about what do we mean by principles, why is it important, how do we apply it, um, where can we see the truth in that, and then that gives um, our children the foundations to be able to go forth and, and recognize those truths. And I mentioned earlier about how in today's society it's so hard um, sometimes to discern between truth if we didn't have clear principles and didn't have the light of Christ to, to follow. Um, and so, as I mentioned, um, American Heritage have our seven principles um, of personal and, li and civil liberty. And these, um, you do have a copy uh, on the back of the mission statement. Um, and I'm just going to spend some time going through 
um, each of these with you. Um, and feel free to, to add notes around each section. Some I'll spend a little bit longer than, than others. They are all uh, have equal merit. Uh, just some resonate um, quite a lot with me. And I think the first one, I love that the first principle we look at is divine identity and purpose. God is our loving Heavenly Father. He's endowed each of his children with the gift, sorry, of life, the freedom to choose, and a divine identity and purpose. And the reason, hi, welcome. Um, the reason why I love this is because I think it's the foundation of the foundations, really. Um, we, when we know who we are and whose we are, we are empowered. I just want to um, go to Moses real quick um, and just read. I'm going to be uh, chapter one. Um, God reveals himself to Moses. Moses is transfigured and then he's confronted by Satan. And I'm going to um, not read directly. I'm just going to take out certain sentences and just go through a few things. So uh, Moses saw God and God spake unto Moses saying, Behold, I am the Lord God Almighty and endless is my name for I am without beginning of days or end of years and is not this endless. So he, God announces to himself, I am God. So he knows who God is and the power that God has. But then the next verse I love, he says, And behold, thou art my son. First time, he says, thou art my son. So now Moses and us, by, by way of reading it and applying it to our lives, now we know who God is so, and also who we are, who we are to him. And that this almighty being is, has created us. We come from him and therefore also have his power um, and will eventually um, have all of the power as well, all of God's power he passes on to us. Um, so he says, behold thou my son, first time. And I will show thee the workmanship of mine hands. So he's willing to, to teach us if we are willing to learn. And then it continues, wherefore no man can behold all my works, um, because there's so much. God is endless. And he says, I have a work for thee, Moses, my, my son. Second time. Second time, he says, reminds Moses who he is. Um, I have a work for thee, Moses, my son. Thou art in the similitude of mine only begotten. We are just like the Saviour, we are just like um, each other, and therefore we have that power. Again, reminding us who we are and whose we are. Um, he's full of grace and truth. Christ is full of grace and truth. Because we are made in his image, we too can have grace and truth. And he says, and behold, this one thing I show unto thee, Moses, my son. I've seen a pattern here. Third time. Third time he says this. Um, For thou art in the world, and now I show it unto thee. So why was it so important for Moses to know who he was and whose he was? Because later on in the scriptures, we then see um, that Satan comes to tempt him. And he says, Moses, son of man, worship me. And it came to pass that Moses looked upon Satan and said, Who art thou? For behold, I am the son of God in the similitude of his only begotten. Where is thy glory that I should worship thee? I just, this is one of my favorite scriptures. Um, just because of the simplicity, but the power that is there. That when we know who we are and whose we are, there is an unlimited amount of power. That we are empowered and emboldened to go forth, knowing um, with a surety of what we can achieve. And, being, and knowing that we can discern between the noise and the distractions of the world and the truth. And that's something that our students need to learn. They need to have it embedded in their hearts because everything else comes from this first principle. As Grant mentioned earlier, I have taught in such a variety of schools. I've taught half um, faith schools, Church of England. I've visited Catholic schools in the UK. We have a real mix. I've taught in all girls schools, all boys schools. I've taught in mixed, um, 11 to 18. We don't separate them into middle school and high school. Um, and I have always been drawn to church schools, to Church of England, and I loved that we could have assemblies and, and meetings where we could pray together, we could sing hymns, uh, which is another form of worship and prayer, and that we could have this conversation. But the one thing that American Heritage um, stands out above is because you can delve deeper. The plan of salvation allows us 
to truly delve deeper. And that was something that I, I would try and sneak in to my students. Um, in London, not a lot of people know about the LDS faith. Some do, some don't. Um, and so I'd always kind of put a few little conference talks up or a few little quotes and scriptures and um, I have to be careful. <laughs> but but, um, but it, I, it was lacking. And I love already, I've said love a lot, I feel like I'm repeating it. I really do know this. There's a lot of love that I'm feeling right now. Um, <laughs> and a lot of gratitude as well. Um, but I, I really appreciate being able to be that open and honest with our students, that to give them not just a blanket answer with who are we or with God's children, you know, just like a passing comment, but to really get into the depths of that identity because that is pivotal. We are all drawn by identity. Um, and so not only that, but when we know who we are, we also know who our neighbours are, right? Because if, if, I'm a, if I'm a child of God, so are you. And so our children, we're teaching them to be kind to one another. Children will learn. Sometimes, you know, an unkind thing is said here or there. But we're teaching them to value each and every one of God's children because we know who they are and whose they are as well. So that's why I spend a lot of time on this first principle because it's, it's just so crucial. And it's such a blessing that we can go into that depth at American Heritage. The second principle uh, is liberty through Christian self-government. So God has given us the freedom to choose liberty and eternal life through Jesus Christ, or captivity and death. I love this bit. As we seek to obey the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ and receive his grace, using the atonement in all of its capacity, we will experience liberty. Um, so I just think, how do we self-govern? Uh, how do we self-government, uh, and how does it lead to liberty? Um, I'd just like you to, to think about that and just talk to your neighbour for, for two seconds. Not two seconds. A minute. Um, how does self-government lead to liberty? Because there's an element of obedience that is needed to, to Christ, to God, to, and, and humility to know, okay, I don't know everything. If you think you're the smartest person in the room, you know that you're not going to be. Um, you're in trouble. And so I think that idea of being able to self-govern allows you to have obedience, but also that humility to, to be a disciple of Christ, to align um, yourself to, to God's values and to God's um, Path, even sometimes when that seems hard. It also allows us to have opportunities. When we are obedient, we're given opportunities that maybe might not have happened before. Um, I remember, just in seminary, many, many, many years ago, um, the, the, the analogy of the kite. I don't know if you all remember that. The idea that a kite doesn't fly without the string. Okay, because you need that, that tension to hold it. And that the commandments, that, um, that principles of truth that we follow are, is that string that keeps us, that allows us to soar, allows us to fly. Um, and so when we accept that, when we learn to self-govern, that allows us that, that freedom and the ability to grow. And this is a life of progression. Um, and so we, we want to be able to grow. I think... So, third principle is Christ-like character. 
Jesus Christ is the standard of character and the model of all virtues. Through his atonement, we become like him. America's heritage provides examples of men and women who were liberated by obedience to the teachings of Jesus Christ and who sought freedom to develop and express Christian character. At American Heritage, we are very mindful of the curriculum that we produce. We want to work with you. Uh, we're very mindful of the, the teachings that we want to share with our children. And so we always are deliberate with who we pick as examples. And we always compare those examples to the characteristics of Christ. Why do we do that? Why do we always look to Christ? Because that's where truth is, correct? Um, that's where we know we cannot go wrong. And so if we're looking at examples throughout history, throughout novels and literature, if we're able to see characteristics of Christ, then we're able to recognize truth. Um, and when we're able to recognize truth, we're able to move forward boldly and proudly, knowing um, that we're on the right path. Um, I'm just looking at my notes, I'm sorry, I'm not as well versed as, as Grant and, and Leland. Um, so I think recognizing truth is, is important. It allows us to have grace, it allows us the joy of daily repentance, and it allows us to always remember um, who to turn to when we have questions and doubts. Our next principle is um, for conscience, the most sacred of all property. Why is it important to live with integrity and conscience? I'd like just to discuss for two minutes with your partner. Why is it important to live with integrity of conscience? That's wonderful, just 
the idea of the Holy Ghost guiding your conscience. Um, and th therefore, it's so important to be in tune with the Holy Ghost so that we can maintain our integrity, that we can trust our conscience. Our conscience determines our future. It determines decisions that we make. Um, it determines how we respond to other people's questions, how we respond to other people's actions. It determines uh, how people view us. Hopefully we all want to be known as being integral and being someone that could be relied on um, as an example of truth and light. We have it in the 11th article of faith. Uh, we claim the privilege of worshipping Almighty God according to the dictates of our own conscience and allow all men the same privilege. Let them worship how, where, or what they may. With that, it just shows how vital it is that we follow principle one, two, and three so that we have the ability to have an integral conscience and that we're able um, to, to feel confident with our decisions. Um, and I feel that this principle, it, it links to the, the previous three and then it affects the next, the next three principles that we're about to discuss. And so if we do not learn how to know truth and, and learn what truth is, then our conscience might be slightly skewed. And that will then lead to different decisions, um, which will then have an impact on family, friends, civilization. Um, and so it all has this knock-on knock effect. Um, and so hopefully you've seen a pattern of the first three principles are looking at yourself, looking at you, branching out to your to your um, family and friends and self-governance, um, and uh, sorry, looking out to Christ um, and thinking about truth. And then this is the pivotal moment where that then leads to action. And action then leads to influence of family and friends and civilization. So we'll move on to our um, fifth principle, which is the family, religion, and uh, civil government. How does the disintegration of families, religion, or civil government, government impact personal and civil liberties? Uh, I know it's funny that a British person is talking about foundations in America. And, um, but actually, as I was talking to Amanda and Megan, I was saying um, my family, my dad's side of the family, my biological father is Irish. Uh, and so I actually love the story of America fighting away from the tyranny of England. Um, I can relate a little bit. I mean, I did bring my Kerbal Tees over because I, you know, um, but I can relate because my great great uncle fought for Irish independence. Um, they didn't want to be under English rule, funny that. Um, and so they, he fought for Irish independence and he was jailed and, and thankfully uh, wasn't injured. Um, but he then went on to become Minister of Education uh, in Ireland's first government, um, public Ireland's first government. And so it's fun to hear family stories. Uh, and so, although I am British, uh, I really resonate with the idea of um, how important family is and how important um, civil government is and why we need to protect it um, and how it impacts our civil liberties and how sometimes we can take that for granted and sometimes because we don't want to offend others um, maybe we're not as forthright with our views and I think it's important to recognize that we can have different views we can accept other people's we can mourn with those who mourn if they feel that it's a different idea that they want but it's important that we stay true to what we know the principles of truth um, and so the family is at the core. You are the most important people in the room, raising your children, our children. Um, and we want to support you. Grant and Leland have mentioned that. Um, so why is it important to protect the family? How does disintegration of families, religion, or civil government impact civil liberties? Can we just discuss that for two minutes?
Okay. Um, hopefully we've seen the link how families are integral. Families impact faith and religion and organize religion and how that then impacts government and laws. Anyone have any thoughts with that? Or oh, Grant, you've been... You've been <laughs> you, you, you were pointed to, so... <laughs> Um, okay, any, any thoughts on that? I think... Um, I think we see it in the scriptures all the time. The Book of Mormon, the Pride Cycle. Uh, but we see how, when we see the dis disintegration sorry, of, um, of families, how civilization starts to fall. Uh, and so again, that's looking to the primary source. Uh, and thinking about well, what can we learn from that? What can we apply so that we don't fall into the same to the same traps? Um, I'd share a story. I, I was flying out here three, three weeks ago. I landed, and on the plane, I was talking to some other British uh, ladies. Happened to be sat next to two, two other English women, and they didn't really know much about the church. Um, their sister was. Um, she might be a professor of university, the University of Utah, actually. Or oh, she's teaching there or something. There's a link. So she, that's why she's here, and she um, was getting married. So they were over here for a wedding. They'd never been to Utah before. And we were talking to the um, flight attendant, and just talking about Utah and you know how beautiful it is and what they were doing. And um, it was interesting. The, the flight attendant was an LDS, um, and we were just having a good conversation, and then she just mentioned one thing, and she didn't say it in any uh, particular way. It was very neutral with what she said, but but it made me laugh because um, she said, "Yeah," she said, um, "I know we don't say Mormons, but she said Mormons are great. Um, they really get into politics, <laughs> and, and I I loved that because I just think we, we practice what we preach, right? And just the idea of." We should be influential, we should be influencing our families, we should be teaching our families at the core, allowing our, student, our children to, to grow, to then influence um, civilization and governments. Um, and, and so when we do that, um, we're again applying principles of truth and ensuring that, that we are um, safely traveling the journey that is life, the ups and downs. Um, so, if we know that family is so important, if we know that government is so important, civil government, uh, and how it impacts our civil liberties, how it allows us to maintain that freedom that we talked about before, then how can students cultivate self-government in others? How can we then take what we've learned, that principle, and apply it? This goes to our sixth principle, which is cultivating self-government in others. So individuals who experience liberty through Christ seek to bless others with liberty. Uh, I lived in an American house state uh, in London for a while, and so we did Thanksgiving. I uh, I'm so excited about autumn fall, right? Fall, okay. Um, and so, um, and so we went round and gave thanks, and one of my friends said that she was grateful for education, that she lived in a country where as a woman she was able to enjoy the blessings of education. And as an educator, that really hit her. Um, but not only that, I think something that I value is having the right education. Education that, not just of knowledge, but of skills that allow, um, allow us to discern. And uh, I think it's really important that as we plant the word of God into our hearts, that people see that example. And that's how we're able to then teach and testify and help others. And through that, um, being able to be an example of Christ and help others come unto him, which is our goal. Um, and we, we don't have to be loud with that. Sometimes that's needed. But sometimes it's the small and simple things. And so when we're shining that light, when we have the countenance of, of Christ shining from us through truth, people see that. Uh, being surrounded by a like, very diverse uh, group of people, um, it was always a privilege to be able to say why I was so happy all the time, 
or there's just something about you, Caroline, what is it? You know, um, and being able to share the gospel and say, you know what, it's because of my Savior. Um, and I think that's how we're able to, to, to be able to cultivate self-governance in others, family, friends, because we're teaching as Christ taught through example. Um, and we can do it in, in a way that, that resonates with them. And, and Christ will provide those opportunities and our students will be blessed to be able to have the skills as they go out into the world to, to be that light, to be that example. Um, and to remember this principle that it is it's a responsibility as well. It, it's a right that we've been given. Um, when we have the blessings of light, it is our, it is our responsibility to, sh to shine that on to others and to share that. Um, and to make sure that our decisions that we make reflect that. Um, so people know where to look. And so um, that then ties into our seventh principle, which is fullness of liberty through unity with God and man. I'm sorry, Leland, I don't, I've completely lost track of time, so I should have a clock next time. Um, so as we seek truth and draw closer to Christ, we will be united. Sometimes it seems that we're quite um, divided at times, especially because of news and social media. Um, I love that Grant was saying uh, that life is better than we think. And I said, there's actually a book called Factfulness, um, which talks about statistics, how life is fantastic. Um, there is so much good, so much good in the world. Yes, there are hard times. Yes, there are difficulties. Yes, there's wars and rumors of wars and there's scary things going on. But life is good. We have the fullness. And um, when we hold true to these seven principles, we're able to recognize that, and we're able to go forth armed with truth and light. Um, it's kind of touched upon briefly a little bit by Leland, but the plan of salvation is all about liberty. We have been given choice, and it wasn't choice since we've been born. We were given choice in pre-existence. That's how fundamental um, liberty is, that we were able to choose to follow Christ's plan. That is something that is fundamental to our happiness and to our success and to our progression. And so as we follow these seven principles, that's a guideline to help us be able to, to accomplish all things through, through the help of, of God and through the help of other, um, other people. And so I would just like to encourage um, all of you to help our students really come to learn and love these seven principles, to embed them in their hearts, um, to value the, the teachings that they bring. There is an educator, he sadly passed away, he's Sir Ken Robinson, he's English, he's done a few TED Talks, um, and he gave this quote, the gardener does not make a plant grow, the job of a gardener is to create optimal conditions. And obviously we know Christ is the ultimate gardener. But um, we can be a part of that. We, we are his helpers. We can be his hands in moments. And, and I feel that's why we're all drawn to American heritage. I, it's wonderful that everyone has a story here. Um, I, I really am enjoying hearing everyone's story. And please do come and tell me your story of how you found American heritage. Um, their tender mercies, their miracles, um, and it just shows that God's hand is, is in this work. Um, and that he wants us to embed these principles to provide those, that optimal um, environment for our students to thrive and to grow. Um, I just love that. And, uh, and so, yeah, please, please do help us with that. And we will teach your students as well those seven principles. Um, I just say that in every question. Amen. Let's take another five minute break and then we've got two more important presentations. We're gonna make it we're gonna to try to catch up on some time. We're running just a little bit late. Make it for the PSO and then some important information about Veracross and our front office staff from Sarah DeCosta. Okay. And we're still gonna to try to finish if we can around eleven. Uh, but take five minutes, maybe four minutes, and then we'll get started. Okay.
Thank you. 
just up and running. Thank you for being this Okay, so to look longer, uh, you, will, you will access your very current point. Once there, you will click on my household. So this is what it will look like first. Household and then it's a training record. When you click on that, it will open under school policy forms, the parent service, and training record. Click, click on that to your hours. It will open up for that parts are what I'm going to give you today. To log your hours, you need to go to this first section and fill in briefly what you did for service. So for example, here is five hours, helping symbol, and at the SLC on August 22nd, 8 a.m. to 10, 30 a.m. You don't have to be any more, you can be more, more brief than that. Leave it there. You don't have to do anything with your service hour bubbles, just leave, leave it for now. Go up, up, save policies, and click it, and you're done. You've logged your hours. Way to go. That's it. It's a running document, so it saves what you type in the note. So if you come, come back later, you can log your next bit of service hours, it will still be there. Add to it. So as the year goes on, you will just continue to add to this note box all of your family. As you also go on through the year, as your hours start to add up, you have your own bubble. So maybe by December, hit 10, 10 hours. So put the bubble on 10. And keep going, I mean, maybe you'll hit 65. Who knows? But it, it's a run document. That's all you need to know. Save policies. Keep it going. So we're doing step by step. Mm -hmm. But we're working on one of our little projects. Do, 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 do. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. In fact, to be, to be more specific, See, I have this. If you are preparing food for a specific event, and you've had to drive a significant distance to pick up the food for any event. You can even count that time at your discretion. It's up to you. Uh, it's really all at your discretion. What, what you feel like you can give, what you do give, document that because, because all service matters. All service is appreciated. Nope, you need to add the date as your excellent question too. Yeah, that's why I put on here August 22nd, just from this time to this time. And my other biggest piece of advice that comes from the other campus, from their experience, is log your volunteer hours now, as the year goes on. Don't wait until the end of the year. Just keep a nice running tab somewhere so that you're not scrambling at the end of the year. Okay. All right, that was a lot of information. Please know the PSO board is here to help and serve you. You the parents, you the teachers, you the staff and administration. As our head of schools, Grant Beckwith, so eloquently said, when we join the faithful home with the faithful school, parents and teachers can work in unparalleled synergy toward developing the whole child. So I believe as we serve and interact together, love and Christ-like patience and compassion, we will be assisting in the irreplaceable work and mission of the American Heritage Schools in developing the hearts and minds and bodies of students, of our children, to realize their divine potential. So thank you for giving us the opportunity to serve you. Your service is not because, I mean, it is important for us. We do need you here sometimes to be that extra pair of eyes, to be there on the, the field trip. But much more important than that is the culture that it builds in your, you, in your family, and in the whole school community. So thank you for your service hours in advance. You can stand up just for a minute while we get the computer switched.
in the school uh, because this is going to benefit our kids just as much as it is going to benefit yours. Uh, security and safety is key. Uh, so I want to make sure that you understand that when we ask you for ID, it's not because we don't trust you, it's because we love your kids. We want to make sure they're going home with the right people and it's going to take us a little while to connect faces and kids and parents together. So we appreciate your uh, patience with us as we uh, get to know you, get to know your kids and things. Um, I, I put in the handout uh, just uh, little snippets of information that I thought might be really important to know for the first day of school, especially related to attendance, tardy um, uh, issues, or uh, if your child needs to be picked up from school in the middle of the day for a doctor appointment or whatever, uh, how that is to be handled. Uh, Veracross is a monster of a software program. It has all of our admissions, our grading, um, our forms. It, it, it's a ton of information to learn. I, we are just working on it this summer. Uh, and so your parent portal will be adapting and updating as we get more understanding.
the wrong uniform or missing a uniform piece, we will try and have extra pieces on um, in like the girls' tights that we aren't going to lend out and place back. It's just so um, we will ask you to purchase those items and we will bill you for those um, if your child does need an extra year one piece that day. Um, so, so some new four pieces, like if they forgot their tie, um, you know, we'll have we'll have that and obviously you wouldn't be charged for that. We can take that back. Um, so, uh, on to Veracross, the easiest way for you to get to Veracross is going to be from the website. If you go to Tools, uh, there is Parent Portal, and you can click Veracross, and that will take you to the login. Uh, once you log in, you'll be asked which campus you're attending. Hopefully you all know that answer. <laughs> and then, uh, this is my personal parent portal that I'm just going to use for an example today. Um, a couple of things that I want to point out, which are on the handout, uh, we did talk a little bit about attendance. If your child is going to be absent and you know in advance, you can go to this school attendance tab. And we're trying really hard to find ways to not confuse our American Port campus with our Salt Lake campus. I'm putting SLC on as much as I can so that it's clear which one belongs to our Salt Lake campus. Um, and we are also working to see if there are ways to remove some of the American Fork stuff from your portal um, to not junk it up and make it a little bit easier for you as well. So like I said, this is a evolving uh, portal and you'll see lots of changes as we uh, get into the school year more. Um, but once you are in here, you can log your students' um, attendance if they are late, if they have to be picked up early. You can communicate that if, they're go if you're going on vacation um, or extending your spring break for whatever reason, you can include all of that in this form here. Um, the, the next section is my household. And before school starts, I would really encourage you to just get in the portal, click around, play with stuff, uh, make sure things are up to date. If you go to your family profile, you can see here that your child's medical profile, if there are things missing, like your insurance information, if there's medications that they're taking on a regular basis, you can let us know by putting in a request to update their form here and then we will get that on our end and be able to put the information into the system for you. Um, the um, directory preferences is another area that I would encourage you to take a look at which you have settings. This is gonna show you what information you have made public to the rest of the school. So there's student directories, household directories, faculty and staff directories. If you don't want your work number there, if you don't want um, you know, certain information published for the school as a whole, obviously us as staff would be able to have access. But um, as a school, if you don't want parents to have access to your information, this would be the way to limit that. Um, let's see. Um, Can we show them the carpool directory? So, in, yeah. so directories is the next tab, and again, these are in process of updating, but one of the nice things that you are able to do here is check households that are within 10 mile radius of you, um, and then you can see how close you live to certain people, um, and those would be great contacts for you to make to get carpools set up amongst yourselves. So. Um, that's under, again, directories, households, and then um, if you need to contact a teacher, that would be under your staff and faculty, uh, all their information as well. The uh, calendar link, uh, there will be a way to connect your Google Calendar, your Outlook Calendar through Veracross so that you can input the information. Our calendar has not been created yet, so don't subscribe yet, please. <laughs> Uh, we will send an email out letting you know when those are live and then you can import your information. 
I would hate for you to import all the American Fork stuff into your Google Calendar and then all be confused. So, uh, but that, that will hopefully be, uh, be live by the first week of school. Uh, another tab on here is the payment links. Uh, this is where you will be able to sign up for your extracurricular activities, and this went live last night. So, um, if there is an extracurricular activity that you are interested in for sports, uh, drama, whatever it may be, uh, the payment links is where you will go register your child and um, be able to make your payment for any of those that have a payment. So for example, um, okay, just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Um, Okay, so if your child is eligible, so some of these, um, so there's actually two different soccer groups, third through fifth grade and then sixth through ninth. So because my kids are both in sixth through ninth grade, we're just seeing their registration option um, on here. If you have multiple kids in multiple grades, you'll see all the options available for each of the sports. You can launch the sign up and then, um, It will be working. It will be working, I promise. <laughs> I was playing with it last night and it was working on some of them. So, um, But uh, if you have issues, you can always email me. So, um, like I said, this, this went live very fast. Um, then on the children's job, um, the section that I want you guys to focus on in the next is the classes and reports, and this is because I have been working to enroll the kids in their classes. Some of you um, sent elective choices through the forms that were sent out through the email. Some of you may have signed up a little bit later, didn't get that email for whatever reason, but if you go in here and open your child's classes, you should see blue for pretty much everything except lunch. Um, some of the younger grades, because they're in their individual classrooms, we haven't given them specific time slots for um, when they're going to do history, when they're going to do reading, things like that. So there may be some unassigned sections there, but for our fifth through ninth grade, for sure, if you see uh, white spots, towards the bottom, that's when the electives are happening. It's because I either don't have your electives or um, haven't updated them yet because the form came in later than when I did that grade level. But uh, an email to me would be great, just letting me know, hey, I don't see any elective choices for my kids. I one, I got the form you send it to me, and they got the elective choice. But school starts a nice calendar so that they know which
just the American Fork families going out to the whole school. So this one in particular related to sports tryouts, you may have seen and said, wait, this doesn't make any sense. We don't have you know, a sports tryout for, for middle school. Um, it's because it wasn't meant for our campus and we apologize, uh, but we are working through some of those kinks. So we appreciate your patience there. Um, and then the last but not least, I just, Put some information there on the UTA transit passes at the end of your handout. We are able to get a discount through the UTA to offer passes through the school. Um, if you are taking the front runner, or your kids will be taking the front runner, excuse me, to school in the mornings, we are going to have walking groups from North Temple Station to the school and back each day. Um, and uh, you can talk to me about ordering a transit pass um, for that purpose. If you will not be using the front runner, there is a cheaper version for just tracks, buses, and um, trolleys that you can get directly from the UTA, um, which is I think like $42.50 a month, but it does not include the front runner. So I've had a couple questions about, hey, why is yours more expensive? And it's because it includes more. So if you are interested in having a transit pass that allows you to use all transportation, including the front runner, this is the pass you would want to get. If you're looking at just local, then going through the UTA is the best way to do it. So I know I rushed through a lot there. <laughs> Any questions that I can answer now? What's the earliest? I'll defer to Leland on that one. So we have a faculty prayer meeting every morning at 7.50 to 8. And then after 8 o'clock, the teachers are going to their rooms to prepare. 8 o'clock is about the earliest we'd like your children to arrive if possible. If there needs to be an exception, contact us and let us know. But typically, 8 is the earliest. Uh, and then they won't be allowed to go into the classrooms until 8.15. That just gives the teachers enough time to get set up. By 8.15, they can go in. They may have some early bird kind of work that they do for that first 15 minutes. So uh, what, class starts at 8.30. What about for the seminary kids? When seminary for ninth grade starts at 8.15 oh. in the so seminary room. So they should come between 8 and 8.15, which is why you can drop all of your children off if you have someone in elementary and middle school during that time. That's great. So seminary is okay. Thanks for those questions. Yes. Did you have, like, uh, early days or anything like that? No early days or late days. Okay. We do have some days off. We'll see those on our calendar. We're keep it easy. Okay. Yes. 3.15. I will say there are two early days. The day before the Christmas break, we get off at, as a half day. The day at the end of the school year is a half. Okay. So the school day ends at 3.15. The, if your kids are staying after for extracurricular, uh, they're pretty much all over at 5 o'clock. For the Vera Cross, do both parents need uh, different logins or they use the same one? You can have different ones if you want. Okay. You can use the same one. Yeah, that, that's a preference. Uh, we were, yes, so it's going to be one directional flow around the building, clockwise around the building, if you're looking at it from a bird's eye view. 
that means it will have more right turns instead of left turns. And if we all flow one direction around the building, it will make for a much smoother drop off. I will have you drop off, if you could please, just here along this long sidewalk. Um, when you pick up in the afternoon, same thing. One direction flow around the building. And two direction flow. Where would you like us to enter to? So you'll enter here on the north parking lot, and then you'll end, exit on the south. That's right. We'll send an email about this too. There are probably going to be people here who will be grateful. And we'll review it also on, on the September 7th All Parent Meeting. So you've got a lot, you've joined from a fire hose today, and after the first two weeks, you may have some questions. You certainly can ask those in advance by email or by coming in to talk with us. We want to be as, a, as approachable as anyone you've ever met. You can see we have a very knowledgeable team here. There's a lot of work that goes on. I think starting a school is about 40 times harder than most people think it is. And you can tell that by this kind of situ situation. And Sarah has done a masterful job of quickly grasping and setting up this system that is really a wonderful system. Their cross is very flexible, very capable. I think you'll uh, learn to appreciate it. Your students certainly will. So, anything else for Sarah before we give her a round of applause? Any other questions? No. no. All right. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Now, we're just a few minutes over. Let's conclude. Um, I'll just say two or three things in conclusion. If you haven't received a, I know most of you have, but if you haven't received a welcome guide, or if you'd like an extra copy, you can pick one up in the back. It has honor code, it has information about uniforms, the uniform policy, various uh, expectations as well as some of the offerings, and key events that are coming up. So please get a copy of that and peruse it. I know it's long, I know it's a lot, um, but hopefully it's helpful as a reference guide. Keep it someplace where you can refer to it periodically. Um, we, as I said, uh, are so grateful for your time today. This is a labor of love for all of us. It's a labor of love for you, for your children. It's a labor of love for the teachers, for us as administrators. As Grant started, I want to conclude as well that we are a unified team. I am so grateful for the unity that we feel on our team. There is no contention. There is no fault finding. There is just unity because we're all behind a mission statement that is beautiful and glorious. And that mission statement and those seven principles are in this booklet too, right at the very beginning. So um, everything we do here should be measured against those documents. That's who we are at our core. You'll feel it, you'll sense it. Uh, your children will too. I hope they come home and tell you what my daughter said. <laughs> she came home when she was in eighth grade, she said, Dad, I love my life. <laughs> she just said I have such great friends and great teachers. That's what I want to do too. In eighth grade, right? That's the hardest time. So, um, and then I took her to China for some years. <laughs> That's a good way to manage dating, just to get out. You don't have to get out of shotgun, just say, you're going to China. Anyway, all right. Let's conclude. We're going to have a closing prayer. Chris Moore, our wonderful kindergarten teacher, will offer that. After which, uh, feel free to leave if you have more questions. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of your day, and we'll be in touch by email. And we'll see you. Oh, there are kindergarten and other K through six assessments. You're welcome to come back to those this afternoon from 12 to 3:30 if you've signed up. If you need help signing up, let us know. And also tomorrow, kindergarten and sixth grade assessments, just to help us. Prepare for the screen. Chris Moore. Sorry, Tom, Father, we have we are very thankful for this opportunity to be able to come to this meeting and find out about the educational opportunities for the children that will be teaching as well as uh, the children that will be attending the school and we Father, we ask that you please bless that thy spirit will attend us throughout this school year and that we'll be able to teach the children well, not only how to read and write and do math and other subjects, but also teach them of the essentials as Christ. 
please help us to do things that will help us to move us toward the end. We love thee and we serve this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
We've got a place we can store. Okay. <laughs> What's your name? My name is Shane. Shane, okay. Mr. Arthur. Door, huh? He's on that door. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I have a superpower too. Yeah. I used to be an emergency medical technician. <laughs> oh, oh.
Lisa. 